So let's talk about training. We all need to polish our skills before we can do anything just right, and the more fine and complicated the task, the more practice we need to count ourselves as full members of the band. And when you have to attempt the delicate symphony of movements that go into producing language sounds, you know there's going to be some crashing around at first. But there can still be some rhyme and reason to how we crash. I'm Moti Lieberman, and this is The Ling Space. Welcome to The Ling Space. Babies come into the world all ready to go for learning language, primed to listen to the enormous wealth of words and sentences around them and compile a solid grammar. But producing language is a totally different thing. We're not ready for that at all. Let's look beyond the fact that little baby heads actually need to restructure themselves before infants can really make speech sounds. And let's also look beyond the babbling stages, as interesting as those cute little syllables can be. No, today we want to look at what's going on with kids when they're ready to go. They've got their tongues and larynxes in the right places, and they're excited to try saying real words to real people. At this point, by the time they're a year old or so, they already know all the relevant speech sounds of their language. They've honed in on those phonemes. But just because they know what they should be doing doesn't mean they can actually pull it off. Like a band with a hyperactive eight-year-old drummer, speech goes very fast, and it requires some very precise movements to get done at very exact moments. Miss your target by a few millimeters? You've just made a different sound. Did you forget to open up a path for air to go out your nose? Oops, wrong consonant. So a lot of the mistakes that little kids make when they're learning how to talk come down to still not having all the practice they need to get everything right. And so these kinds of mistakes are really common. If you look across all the different child speech errors, over 90% of the words young kids say show these kinds of mistakes. Anytime that you've talked with a kid who's one or two or three, you've probably noticed them, and the odds are you thought they were super cute, too. So today, we'll look at substitution errors. This is where kids substitute one phoneme for another, and they tend to fall into a few different types. Fortunately, most of them are really transparent as to what changes. Let's start with a process called stopping. Try to picture this. You're running towards your new girlfriend's ex who's picked a fight with you, and you want to punch them. You go all the way up to them, and you cock your arm back, and you let your fist fly towards their face. Now, what's going to be easier for you? Holding back at the very last second with your knuckles almost grazing their face, or slamming into them? It's the slamming, right? So that's what's going on with stopping, too. The sound you want to make is a fricative, and to do that, your tongue or lips have to go almost the whole way to close the airflow through your mouth, but not quite. Like, if you want to make a s, your tongue moves up towards the alveolar ridge behind your teeth, so close that the air flowing by gets all noisy and strident. But it can't go the whole way to the ridge and close off the airflow, or you'll make a t. And that's what kids do. They can't control their tongues well enough to pause just short, so instead of a fricative, they make a stop. Now, these stops will usually get pronounced at the same place and have the same voicing as the original sound the kid wanted to make. Everything we usually use to describe where and how consonants are pronounced will be the same, except for the manner of articulation. Like, sing will turn to ting, or zebra to debra. But what if there isn't exactly a place to make a particular stop? Like, we have labiodental fricatives like f and v, and interdental fricatives like th and the, but we don't have stops in those places, so what happens then? Well, kids just go to the closest place otherwise. So the thun thing will also turn to ting, since the back of the teeth or the alveolar ridge is the closest place to stop. Closing your lips entirely is pretty easy too, so your fuzz and vuzz will turn into bilabials, like five turning to pibe. And you can see, the voiceless f stays voiceless in p, but the voiced v becomes a voiced b. It's pretty close to the same, and this is really common. But it's not the only kind of substitution error. Just as we can look at stopping as missing the mark by closing too much, you can also let your tongue and lips be too open. If it gets too open, it turns into a glide, basically just this side of a vowel. And so, this process is known as gliding. You can't get the almost open controls quite right. This is where you get some of the most stereotypical cute kid errors in English, like rock becoming walk, or Lucas becoming wukus. No. For English, r usually turns to w when it undergoes gliding, but l has been found to shift to w or y. Like look might become wook, but laugh might become yaf instead. And this seems to depend on what that l is near. The upcoming u uh makes the l go more towards w, since it's already far back and almost wuish already. But the further front vowel, like a, makes the choice of the further front glide, y, more likely. 
So those are two different mistakes kids make because they can't finally control how open or how closed their mouths are. But let's take a look at a different kind of substitution pattern. First, how about this? Try controlling your lips. Easy, right? Or hey, try wiggling the tip of your tongue around. That's also pretty simple. But now try moving the main body of your tongue like all the way back there. That's harder, right? So there's a tendency for kids to move consonants further forward in the mouth. They have more control up there, even if it's not perfect. This is known as fronting, where we move the sound's place of articulation more towards the front. So let's look at a few examples of this. Take a simple word like go, that goes all the way at the back of your mouth. You make it by raising the body of your tongue to the soft palate. If you front the sound to the alveolar ridge, you get do. Do is still a voice stop, but now you can do it with the tip of your tongue instead. Way easier. But it's not just with stops. Say you're a baby and you want to talk about your toy ship. Well, you can move that forward too, from being post-alveolar to alveolar and get sip instead. One cool thing about fronting is that sometimes it leads babies to make sounds that aren't even in the language that they're learning. Like, most dialects of English only have two Africans, the voiceless ch and the voiced j, both post-alveolar. But why keep things behind the alveolar ridge if you can move them up? For a word like chalk, you could move it forward and say chalk. Or for jump, you could keep it all alveolar and say zump. English might not have t or z as phonemes like some other languages do. Like, they're both good sounds in languages like Albanian and Wolsu, for example. But English learning kids will still make them. Our next error type is kind of similar, in that it happens because controlling everything that you need to make a particular sound is hard. If you want to make a nasal consonant, you have to do two things around in your vocal tract. You have to close the air flowing out towards your lips, and you have to lower your soft palate so that the air can escape instead through your nose. You need those two ingredients or it's not a nasal. But doing both of those things at once is really tricky, and so kids will sometimes leave out the opening up the nose part. Their velums stay up, and so they make, well, just normal stop sounds like buh or duh instead. This process is known as denasalization. So you can see this at work in something like Kim turning to Kib or Pine turning to Pied. They stay voiced because nasals are voiced, but they sound just like regular B and D. If you don't know what word was intended, you wouldn't be able to tell just from what they said. So say go to bed and go to Ben could be the exact same thing. There's also nothing stopping kids from doing more than one of these in the same word. In fact, they do that a whole lot. If you look at a word like jam, a two-year-old might instead say zab, so fronting the first consonant and denasalizing the second one. Or take a word like knives. You could see dived with denasalization at the beginning and stopping at the end. So when children make these cute mistakes, it doesn't mean that they don't know what sounds their language uses. Often they know they're wrong, as we'll talk about back on the website. It just means that working all their different mouth bits is really, really hard. To sound like a big kid, you just have to go through a whole lot of training. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If you didn't just glide on by, you learned that kids make a lot of speech errors because they can't quite manage their mouths yet. That some mistakes, like stopping and gliding, happen because of a lack of fine control to keep from being all open or all closed. That fronting comes from there being more articulatory control at the front of the vocal tract. And that denasalization happens because doing two mouth things at once is too hard. The Ling Space is produced by me, Moti Lieberman. It's directed by Delelise Prévost, and it's written by both of us. Our editor is Georges Coulomb, our production assistant is Stéphane Herdevies, our music is by Shane Turner, and our graphics team is Atelier Muse. We're down in the comments below, or you can bring the discussion back over to our website, where we'll have some extra material on this topic. Also, try dropping by our new store, where we have a bunch of cool linguistic stuff. Check us out on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you want to keep expanding your own personal link space, please subscribe. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Wa chukyo!